So the very, very, very first part is a general presentation about the challenges of doing, of trying to do gift economy as an island within a world that, as far as I know, continues to merrily and horrifically function in, on the basis of accumulation, exchange, and, deser and who deserves what. Those are the kind of like, I, um, it's, it's like accumulation is the expression of the fundamental scarcity that all patriarchal societies live in. Exchange is the expression of the separation that then comes from the scarcity. And deserve thinking is the powerlessness because um, basically in a world that is based on the maternal gift economy, needs have power. Meaning, if I know that you have a need, I'm oriented towards it. If you know that I have a need, you're oriented towards it. When we have to do, I deserve this, it means I don't trust the power of my need. And then we, then, then we have powerlessness. And the exchange is, we are not together. We are separate from each other. If I give to you, you have to give to me. If you give to me, I have to give to you. That is how it functions in the patriarchal world. And the fundamental scarcity is, if I don't set things aside and don't allow other people to have access to them, then sooner or later I won't be able to meet my needs. That is how it functions. So we need to change things at all of these three levels in order to fully restore a gift economy. Slower? Thank you. Okay. So you can uh, shift to the next one. Um, you can move it. That's what I just talked about. So. Essentially, there are three places that we can do the shift. And we have different capacity when the world around us functions as it does. Our capacity to make change in each of these is different. But it, I find it really helpful to separate out how money comes in. Uh, and, and this presentation is all about money. It's not about resource flow in general. But the, the, it's the hardest one to shift. But if this works, then everything about who does what is on a certain level easier. You just look at who, where is the need, where is the willingness, where is the capacity, and you do it. That is how we function outside of money. That is how we function within NGL. But this is focused on how we deal with money because we are not able and I think at this point, outside of the rural global south, there are no places that people are able to attend to their material needs in full with what they have where they are. It was very startling to me when I discovered that in the Middle Ages in Europe, villages were self-sufficient. Now it would be completely impossible to imagine that, but it was the case. And the solution is, of course, reducing consumption. But I don't see us immediately able to do that. But <coughs> fundamentally, it means that for the foreseeable future, unless large structures change, we need to engage with the market in order to get our needs met. And that means we need to engage with money. So no matter how much gift economy we function on at any other level, we have points of exchange with the world in order to, to do other things. So this is how money comes in, how money is distributed, and how money is given to others. And others here means the people who are not part of the organization or the community. It's others outside, like if you pay taxes, or if you have a vendor that you buy things from or stuff like that. Not the money that circulates within. That's the second one. Okay, going. And there are, I want to review what are the challenges because I think it's very helpful to see. The task is daunting and overwhelming. And still, 
um, I will then show you what steps we've actually taken within NGL. So we need to undo exchange for money to come in on the basis of a gift. So for example, if, yeah, when, when we do an event, um, we tell people, let's say, uh, right now I have a nice short phrase that I finally came to, which is give the most that you can give without overstretching or resentment. It's very simple, it captures it sufficiently. And I then also tell people, we are fully dependent on what people give us to function. And still, when a person reads this, even if I tell them not to, they're going to think, oh, how much does an event like this cost somewhere else? And, and they're going to compare. And I had someone many years ago say to me, I want to do this program and I want to do this other program that is done by another NBC trainer, and you have a sliding scale. I didn't have a full gift economy at that time. You have a sliding scale, and this other person doesn't have a sliding scale. So I'm going to give them what they're asking for, and I'm going to give you the lowest on your scale so I can do both. <laughs> Very bluntly said this. It was so refreshing to get a window into how it goes because the exchange is and the scarcity are so deeply in us that that challenge exists that people will give too much or too little uh, because they cannot fully uncouple giving from receiving. Uh, is, are things so far clear as, yeah, okay. And then, yes. hmm? Um, within um, um, the other thing is, yeah, that I already touched on this, and and also for the people doing it, to actually release and say give what you can, can be very scary, because if I tell you give what you can, I the scarcity within me arises, and. It is risky business, but it's not like the other one isn't risky. It's just that it has more of an illusion that it isn't risky. So um, I want to pause, just see if there are any questions or comments so far. I like to do that, go through a couple of slides and then pause. Questions bring out more, so please do it. Okay, then I'll keep going. So now the next set of slides, uh, 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 yeah, the next set, um, I think I'm going to jump over this to how we attend to those challenges. Uh, one more. Okay, so one of the things is how much say I have. When I ask you for money, I have quite a bit of say about how that is going to function. Not fully because I am also engaging with where you are and, you know, all kinds of structures outside and whatever. But in terms, I can say how it's going to be if I exit exchange then the rest depends on you, but I can do it. Um, whereas in terms of giving money outside, I have very little say. If I'm engaging with a dentist and the dentist says, it's going to cost you $5,000, then I can ju the only option I have is not to do the dental treatment, but not to say, you know, that's too much for me. Uh, will it work for you if I give you only 3000 that option doesn't exist. So how money comes in, I, I have more say than how money goes out, and I have the most say in how money circulates within. Okay, let's go to the next one. So the uncoupling of giving from receiving, when we ask for money in relation to a particular piece of service, so again, there is an event or we sell something, um, 
the most significant strategy is to increase the pool of people who are invited to give. So within NGL, we did this at a certain point where we started a new program for people who are apprentices. And when, we, when it was time to ask them for money, we just had this epiphany. We don't have to ask only of the people who are in the program. Why should they be the only ones asked? We asked of the entire community, both people who are in the program and people who are not in the program, to give as much as they can. And, and that, is, that makes it more sustainable. You can have 10 people in the program and 5,000 people who are being asked to give money. There's no reason not to do that. It, that releases the idea that you are paying for a service. Um, and the other way to do the uncoupling is to separate it in time. Um, so, you know, so often people, it's not always possible, but when, popi when it is possible, so often people, um, you know, are, are, are at, the, at the time of the event, they are asked to give the money. But if you separate it in time, um, and you, especially if you say, come and then give the money afterwards, it, it changes it slightly. We can't do it very much, but at least it changes it. Okay. Um, the next one is um, the habits. It's especially difficult for people to receive something and not give. It is harder for many people to receive without giving than to give without receiving. And the reason for it is historical deeply embedded in us. I, I believe there is a collective um, cumulative trauma of multi-generational experiences, which is that debt was the first way that slavery came into the world. So if you give me something and I don't give you back, I owe you. And if I owe you, at, at the tail end of that line, I can be enslaved. That is how it was uh, long ago. And that still lives in us, that being in debt is one of the worst things that uh, can happen. Um, so if we can actually walk people through it, so when I ask people for money, I literally go through a visualization. I ask them to imagine giving zero, which many people in the end do give zero. And to imagine it and to allow themselves to receive the gift, that is a little bit of uncoupling. Um, and then the thing about it's really easy to um, give zero. At this point, uh, for the different things that I do as still an individual, not yet through NGL, although that it's moving more and more to NGL, but whatever it is, between the things that I do and the things that NGL does, it's about 50 to 60% of the people who give nothing. And that is delightful for me because it gives me feedback that there's trust in the field. If it was 5%, I would think that people are still not giving themselves permission to give zero. That is, that is uh, very, very important because if the zero option isn't real, then it isn't gift. Then it's still exchange with sliding scale. Now, now the, the, it's exchange and gift is not binary. It's not like you're either in exchange or in gift. It's a spectrum along several axes. And, and I'm not going to get into that here. But we can... The more it's possible for people to not give at all, the more we are in the gift. Um, and the last thing is that when we ask for money, we ask in relation to what we need, not in relation to how valuable the thing is. So, um, for example, 
um, this last uh, last year we did a course. Uh, three trainers did a course, and when we divided the money between us, uh, the person who did the most work received zero. Why? Because she didn't need it. This was actually Emma. She didn't need it, and therefore no money went there. And the person who did the, le the least work in some ways received the most money because she needed it. That, is, that boggles people's mind. And then there were assistant trainers, and they also received a wide range of money, untying money from value and tying it instead to actual sustainability needs is a huge shift, a huge shift that takes a long time to integrate. Okay, next. Yeah, so the, the key is not to embrace the gift economy unless I am able to release attachment to outcome. And you know we can you can take baby steps, release some attachment or whatever. But to take the risk without the willingness for the outcome to be horrible is is beyond capacity. All experimentation needs to be done within capacity. Otherwise, you will confirm to yourself that this thing doesn't work, and you will never do it again. If you do a little one and you get some flow of things happening, you build capacity over time. Yeah. Next. I have a question for when you use the word passport. Yeah, no. <laughs> Can you say a bit more how do you find sustainability needs? Because you said some people needed it and some others not. <clears throat> do you have a process on how do you figure out what is the actual need or what is over capacity? Like if someone says, I want to build a house, a house and I need 200,000 euro, is that something that you consider? Or so uh, we, will, we will get to this when I show you the actual form okay. within NGL that we fill out uh -huh. about our needs. Okay. I, I will get to that, but fundamentally, um, there's a principle of letting people define their needs mm -hmm. instead of somebody setting some objective or, or external set of criteria about what does or doesn't count as a need. And then the learning happens through feedback. So for example, if you say I need 200,000 to build a house um, and you know, the rest of us say, that's great, we don't actually have it to give it to you then you get the feedback that there isn't capacity for you to build the house. Okay. So, so it's the, it starts from the individual, but then there is the, the interdependence of it. So feedback is built into this every little step of the way. Okay, so, yeah. Yes, yes, the, 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 the simple sentence I say is life emerges from flow, functions in togetherness, and results in choice. Patriarchy emerges from scarcity, functions in separation, and results in powerlessness. So the essence of scarcity is loss of trust in life. If I don't trust life, then I'm not going to trust that this will be here later. So I'm going to grab it and hold on to it if I can. And if you also want it, I will start fighting with you. That's, that's the, the way that the scarcity leads to the separation. If there isn't 
enough and I can't release into trusting. Either that there will be enough or if there isn't enough, we will find another way or some of us will die and that is part of life. It's deep, this, this thing about trust in life. is not an insurance policy. Trust in life is trust in the larger picture that everything works, not that it will be okay for me. You cannot be an individual isolated from everything else and be in full trust in life. Yeah? So that's where the accumulation starts and the exchange is coming from the accumulation. I'm not going to give anything to you if I don't get something else back. More? Okay, so how we distribute money within, no one tells us how to do that, which is um, a kind of a side benefit of the world of separation. We are actually leaning on the world of separation to do this because people won't tell you what to do inside your organization. So we can do whatever we want, except you know, to the extent that there are tax and things and how we organize it. And we can get into that in, at another time. Uh, that doesn't mean we don't have challenges. We have lots of internal challenges. Um, and um, I think I don't want to go back to that thing. We will go through the challenges one at a time. So next. So the first challenge is that we are used to using money to attend to relational needs. So for example, I do a piece of work. If you give me more money, that means you like me. You appreciate the work or whatever. And I am used to measuring my sense of value by how much money you give me. This, this is a big shift to say relational needs get met in relationship. So for example, at, at one point in our, one of our distributions, someone put in a request for some amount of money. I can't remember specifically what it was, but it was that person's partner who is not part of NGO um, has anxiety. They don't actually have material needs, they're fine, but that person has anxiety. And we decided the person is not going to receive money to care for the anxiety of their partner. Instead, there was connection that worked out the issue because anxiety is something you work out through connection, not through money. Yeah, this is a very dramatic, a very dramatic shift. The only function that money has is to be able to get things with it. So I, I've thought a lot about what is actually money and I define money as a unit of claim against the world's resources. That is all that it is. When I have money, I can go somewhere and say, give me something, I got the money. And there's no place that I can I'm a little worried about the sound. Um, okay. Um, so, so if we actually uncouple relation, relational needs from sustainability needs, then we function more within the flow of actually caring for needs. And if the relationship within the organization is not strong enough, that isn't possible. Then people will still bring relational needs into the money, even if we say just sustainability. Because if the relational needs are not attended to in other ways, then they will come to the money. Yeah. Um, um, so this is where a strategy that we've developed in NGL um, I wasn't so much in favor of it at the beginning. 
And I went along with it because that's what the people who were running the process wanted. And now I am just bowing to them left and right. And I'm going to say their names for anyone who ever watches this. That's Magda and Alper, two NGL members. Their strategy is baby steps. Every time we do the process, they make the smallest change possible that will still move it in the direction of more radicality. And gradually it is now possible. When I show you the form, you will see we are so radical and it all was little step by little step. And the other one is you build relationships and increase trust over time. Okay, next. Um, yeah, this is uh, what, um, Anna, what you were talking about is how do I even know what my needs are and, and the deserve that gets into it, you know. Do I really need a 200,000 house? No, but I think I deserve it, you know. Um, so the first thing is we need to accept imperfection. We, we won't get there all at once. We will have things that don't work. Um, and this is the collective baby steps. And there is liberation work that is needed. We distribute money every four months. Um, and in between those times, we now have things we call liberation pods that are beginning to happen where people actually engage with the issues that they have. Um, at a time that isn't the time of the distribution itself. Okay, um, then let's, uh, let's proceed to the next one. Um, so um, there's the concept of shared risk. And um, I wanna say a bit about that. Um, in actuality, Humanity is one shared risk pond. Um, yeah, you know, my, my friend Victor Lewis that I have recommended here, but he says, um, we are all in the same boat, not on the same deck. So if you are on the upper deck, you can still enjoy your privilege while the boat is sinking and people at the bottom are already dying. But it's not like you are going to be able to stay above water when the, when the, when the boat sinks. I, think the, I don't think it's just people, I think it's other species as well. Yes. <laughs> yes, I'm talking about people in that we are all interdependent with each other. I think people have more awareness of our relationship with non-human life than with how much we, we are in, in interdependence. But fundamentally, it's a large interdependent web. I'm just thinking of like the number of species that die a day. And yeah. At the, I mean. Yes, yes. All, all life is with us on this boat and sinking. yeah, sinking. Um, that um, until not too long ago, humanity wasn't one interdependent web. So like several thousand years ago, things could happen in one part of the globe and they would have no impact on things in another part of the globe. That is no longer the case. We, the, the globalization has made it such that everything that happens anywhere influences everything. Um, and so what we are holding on to when we say, I don't want to be part of a shared risk is an illusion of having, you know, being able to rearrange the chairs on the deck. We, we are, there is no substance to it. We can protect ourselves by having access to resources, we can cushion the risk. We can't make it go away. But there is vulnerability in stepping into it. And this is something 
we need to engage with when, when we shift to the gift economy is relationally. We need to support each other in accepting what it means, shared risk. So, uh, for example, um, Menaka is visiting us, the pod now, and we were having a conversation about money. And in a certain moment, it, you know, in terms of her travel and the food and all of these kinds of things. And at some point I realized it doesn't really matter. We didn't even have the conversation because Menaka and our pod are both getting all of our sustainability needs through NGL. And therefore, if she gives us money, that means she will ask for more and we will ask for less. It doesn't change anything. So there was no reason for money to get transferred. Getting to that level is really like an amazing way of recognizing we are all really one. So doing, the, doing this kind of thing exposes the degree of shared risk that it is. Yeah. Next. Um, there, there is, you know, obviously there is a huge amounts of trauma and shame and issues that people have around money. Uh, so, so that if we, and if any group steps, begins to step into shared risk and and um, distribution of money based on need, a lot of stuff will come up that needs to be attended to before or during uh, uh, the distribution process. And we can talk later about different ways of doing the distribution. Uh, I think that may be the last one for this. Go, go ahead. No, there's one more. Um, yeah, this is another piece which we discovered, and that is this. Somebody who grew up in, in, in conditions of impoverishment has the astonishing capacity to make do with little. People have that all over the world to, the, to a degree that the very privileged cannot even imagine how it's possible. But it is happening day in and day out. Somebody who grew up in privilege feels a sense of need at a very different level. That means that if we don't put really lift up all these patterns, even as we're trying to distribute everything based on needs and exit the exchange and all of that, we will recreate distribution patterns that happen in the world so that those with less will receive less because they don't feel the need. And one of the things that is now happening within NGL is the people who are running the process of distribution talk with everyone who submits a request um, and challenge people on how little or how much they ask for. I think they are, they're better at challenging people on how little they ask than they are at challenging people on how much they ask, but I think this will come eventually. Um, yeah? Yeah, I think then you, um, uh, to begin with, this is part of the imperfection. You do the best you can. And then, you know, so we do it three times a year. And, you know, by the end of a four month period, you will know if you ask for too much or too little. You will know, okay. There's no money in the bank of like, oh, wow, there's a thousand extra. So then you calibrate. Also, one of the things that have happened is that in the years that we've been doing this, we've never received from outside sources enough money for all the needs. We've never received that. And so all of us have always received less than we asked for. And we are seeing that we're still all surviving. And a few months ago, we just had an epiphany. Okay, this process is helping us with reducing consumption. We are adapting 
to what there is gradually more and more over time. And that means we are managing to survive with less than we thought we needed. Collectively, that's not true for everyone. Sometimes it goes in the other direction. But it is a way of facing reality. But you learn over time. Yeah. Is it that people are giving all the money they actually have into this pot? Or is it basically people can have nothing or be very wealthy and still ask? For it? No, uh, uh, there is, there is uh, uh, only some people make requests. And there, there are criteria which I will get into later. The people who are working within teams, basically, to, to simplify it. They are the ones who make requests. Everyone is asked to contribute. So you actually have people who are working within teams, but because they have other sources of income, they don't need any money and they even give money. But, but we don't have people who are not within teams who are receiving money within NGO. And you said you set it up as a rule? Or? Not as a, 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 the word rule doesn't apply, but th these are the criteria that we have. Everybody knows. Um, yeah. I, we'll, we'll get to that later. Yeah. Okay. Next. And then it's how to give money to others, which is where I said we have the least say in how to do it. And still there are little bits of things that we can do if you move uh, to the next one. Um, so any little bit that we can uncouple jiggles something. So um, um, for example, one of the things that, uh, that is a practice that we sometimes do is to give people more than they ask for even if it's by a little. We did this here in Tamera last year. We gave more than we were asked. Not by a lot, but we gave more than we were asked, and that seeds the, the flow of gifting. Um, another, another one is to just be creative in the moment in a variety of ways which sometimes work. Um, And I, I no longer remember what the last one means, which is okay, but uh, I will say that um, I have a naturopath that I work with. And at a certain point, I told her that I don't want to give her money per session. And I told her that I would send her money every month, uh, whether or not I have sessions. And what emerged from that is something extraordinary, which is uh, she has become my community naturopath because I bring to her questions about other people. I send her an email and I say, my friend has this condition, do you have any recommendation? And she answers. And it's of course not aligned with how medicine is supposed to be practiced. But in that sense, we have successfully exited the market. I don't think of myself as paying her. I think of myself as committed to um, a reliable, steady little bit of her sustainability because she knows it's not a lot, but she knows she has this little bit of money to count on. And there is actually a, a tiny movement in the US that is just like the CSA, Community Supported Agriculture. It's called CSH community supported health. So people pay a monthly amount to their health practitioner for those who do it, and they have access to all the services that exist. And right now I haven't, um, I haven't had a session with her in several months and I'm still giving it to her. But you know, I may have an acute condition and then see her three times a month and I won't give her more. It's, that is the nature of uncoupling. Okay, so I think this, oh, there is, um, yeah, so when I have to choose between, I, 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 when I was living in the Bay Area, for example, I would go to the farmer's market 
rather than to a supermarket, not only because it's fresh local organic, because in the Bay Area of San Francisco, you can get fresh local organic everywhere. It's, a, it's an obscene privilege of living there. But in the farmer's market, there's relationship. So when I moved from Berkeley to Oakland, I still kept going to the Berkeley farmer's market because that's where I had the relationships. It's a little bit outside the market. It, the more we increase relationality, the, the, the looser it is. And there were many instances of little bits of like, here, take this too. You know, like that happened in relationship. Um, and um, and th the biggest work here is to do the work of mourning, that we are so dependent on entities that will not function in the gift. Next. That's it. The, you can... Um, um, so I'm, I'm going to pause for a moment now. Um, and, um, and everybody, this, this uh, presentation, the, the slide deck is, is available. At, um, you know, you can share the link with anyone. Um, so I want to see if there are questions. Then I want to show you details about how we function within NGL. And then, uh, then we'll take a break and then move to Tamir. More questions about this? I'm curious if it actually gives a sense of a picture of something, if it's specific enough. Yeah? And it does, and it gives you a lot of information in a very condensed way. So if you actually have questions, I need to read all of that again. I would be happy to connect at another time, yeah. Okay, so um, I'm w I want you to do the f uh, put up the form. I'm thinking that you get in contact with the FGH team as well. With the FGH team. Yes, yes. right. Right. <coughs> there it is. Okay. Okay, so every four months a group of us is asked to fill out this. And at the moment, there are about 35 of us that are invited to make requests. And uh, the criteria are specific to NGL, but having criteria is essential because there's always going to be less money coming in than is possible to sustain everything precisely because of the artificial scarcity that exists in the world. Manufactured scarcity that comes from accumulation because when, when things are accumulated, they're taken out of circulation so that there's artificial surplus here and it leaves less for the others so there is um, manufactured scarcity. I once read somebody say, we do not have to do anything about extreme poverty. All we have to take care of is extreme wealth. And if we eliminate extreme wealth, extreme poverty will take care of itself. That was very powerful for me to hear. So um, um, uh, keep going. OK, so keep going to where. Um, um, okay, this is, the first one is, what is your financial situation? And um, it, uh, this is a new one. I'm saying they're baby steps, so this, no, 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 go back. Oh, yeah, this one, yes. This, um, this is a new question that is being asked for the first time, uh, for the first time. It's a, it's, you know, in many circles, this will be seen as intrusive. Right? Like, who are you to ask me about these things? Uh, but it's, it's part of our movement towards more shared risk, so that more of everybody's situation is understood and co-held within the whole. Um, uh, so I, I don't think we need to look at every single one of them 
again, if you want the actual information, it can be given and it won't necessarily fit any other context. None of this is a template. All of this is experimentation. The principles are, are you know, transportable, but not the form. I'm, uh, okay, uh, I'll go to the next one. Um, this is, what is your full need? Regardless of where money comes from, it may be that you can completely sustain yourself without ever requiring anything from NGL. Still, we want to know, it's like it's information. When you have a spreadsheet afterwards with all the responses, you know this is the amount of money that it would take to sustain all the people. If we had nothing else and only NGL, that if we wanted everybody to be sustained within NGL, that is what we would need to generate for people to be fully okay. And we are super far from there, but knowing it, we can know what the gap is and it, and it creates a movement of pull of energy to want to do something about it. Uh, next. Um, and then there's a, this is also a new question. Just what is the relationship? Some people want to make a request or don't need money or do all of this. Um, and um, move, uh, okay. Uh, and in, this includes an opportunity to contribute. Like I said, there are people who do the work and contribute and they have found it confusing to be asked to make a request in one place and to contribute at another time, they want to think about it together. So now it's, it's here. And it also shows the uncoupling. The people who are invited to do this are the people who roll up their sleeves and do the work that it takes to sustain NGL. And within the form that they're asked to, that they're asked to request money, they are also asked to contribute. It's stunning to me to, to have the two s there to show how much we are moving away from deserve. Um, uh, next. Uh, and then we have three levels at which people s express their request. One is the full request, which is basically the gap between the full need and what people have from elsewhere. So that's the full request. We want to know this. And, um, and we give information about why we choose. So you would say, I want to build a $200,000 house. That would go in here. Nobody will tell you, don't put that request there. Um, keep going. Then, um, what is going to happen to you if you don't get it? We're actually asked to name the impacts so that when the actual distribution happens, it used to be fewer people and then the people who wanted, uh, the, made the requests would come together and distribute it amongst themselves. At this point, it's impossible. So we are actually entrusting people to do it for us. And those people have a conversation with each person. So there are three of them. Selini is one of them. You've met her and Magda and Alper. And so if there are 30 people, that means each of them is going to interview 10 people. That's a lot of work. Three times a year. And people are asked if they are willing to entrust these three people. Yeah, we'll come to that. That's in the form. We'll get to that. So then there is the restrained amount, which is something that will allow you to be okay even if you don't get the full request. And then the third one, and the same, it's like what is the impact of not getting it, etc. Keep, keep going down. Keep going down. And then there is the minimum request. What is the minimum amount that would prevent serious impacts on your sustainability until the next distribution circle in four months? You wouldn't put the house there. You just wouldn't. You would know this is not going to be a serious impact for the next four months. 
So part of the answer is how are questions asked? We don't tell people what to say, but we shape the, the energy field within which they answer the questions. Because when your attention is directed to serious impacts, you will have a different response than what is your preferred amount to get? Three million, you know? Okay, uh, keep going. Um, and then keep going also. Uh, then it comes this question. Do you have enough entrustment of the people who are going to be distributing the money? And if you don't, you're invited to consider joining them in doing it. And, um, and you also can release and mourn. It's like, I, I don't entrust them fully, but I'm going to release and mourn. Um, we, haven't, we haven't had much lack of entrustment. And there was uh, one, one time when there was one more person uh, who did it with them. And I didn't have full trust of that person. And I filled out the form and I said, I don't have full entrustment. And I said, why? And they engaged with me. And I said, why? And I said, I can't, I don't have the capacity to join and be part of it. And the why was that I wasn't fully trusting that this person would be able to keep the focus on doing it within purpose. And they gave me an answer that satisfied me and I released it. It was really quite an amazing experience to actually say, no, I don't have full trust, here is why, and to then be engaged with. So the process is very relational. And there are questions about scale, but we, we have like a general answer, which is you scale by doing concentric circles. It's like there is, you know, like within our pod, they don't know what goes on within our pod. If people become pods, then pods digest it within themselves, and then you only have to deal with pods, and then you can have pods of pods, etc. So I, I personally have mapped it out in my imagination to cover the entire human population. I think it's completely doable to function in this way. And then, of course, by then you won't need money. It will just be an actual distribution of actual resources and not money. But in principle, this, this model can scale to all of humanity. OK, uh, is there more there? Um, OK, th that's, that's it. I want to show you a little bit of the document. So the, you, you get the level of transparency. And then everybody's answers are shared with everybody. So we all know what everybody asked. We all know uh, um, how the distribution happened. Sometimes the distribution is observed. Um, the last time it wasn't because they found that it was um, too much distraction for them to be able to focus. It's sacred work to have everybody's sustainability entrusted to you and you need to decide you're getting this, you're getting that. Um, but it was still recorded and everybody could watch it. It's just that they didn't want the distraction. So there is full transparency about this. All the steps are recorded. And uh, go to that thing that was the um, agreement, the right, there it is. So everything about the process is in this document. So you can see everything. And um, there is the, this is the question of who is invited. So you can see the criteria. Um, uh, members and associates who are part of any active team, and others who are apprentices and friends who are part of a team that is generating resources. And this is in recognition of the limit. If you want to engage in a project that doesn't generate resources and you're not already a member or an associate, we can't take care of you. So that's that's your, um, your choice to do it based on sustaining yourself in other ways. So there's no secret here. There's no um, oops, you learn about it after the fact. Yeah, that's, 
that this um, move later um, and this explains the need. So everything, the agreements explain why they are what they are in each of these. Um, and um, keep going. Um, this is about the, the purpose. It, it's like describes exactly how it happens. Keep, keep going, just move slowly. Um, and then there are criteria for, leave it there, the general criteria, how the money is distributed. Of course, it is done in the moment you make choices, but there is a following of these criteria. So it's not random, it's not arbitrary. And the last one um, is embracing intuition. So we know we cannot make it linear. And then if there's less money, if there's more money, that's it. That, that's it. That's what I wanted you to see. And then the last, the last time, um, there was the first time that there was enough more money than the restrained amount that everyone except one person got either their restrained amount or uh, uh, more than that. <clears throat> and $3,000 were put into an emergency fund for the first time since we started so that if any unexpected needs arise in the middle of the four months, because it is pretty difficult to anticipate things for four months, then, um, then there is an opportunity for people. And within days of establishing the emergency fund, um, one of our members had uh, their house was robbed for like the fifth time and all their meat for a whole month was taken. $400 worth of meat. And within two days, they got the $400. It, it was su such a moving moment for us to see. And no one else so far has actually made a request of it. Uh, and people might still. We were at one point thinking that we might, our pod, but we found uh, another source that uh, supported us. So this is, this is the picture. Uh, if you have general questions, and then we'll take a break and then talk about uh, the local context. Yeah. Two questions. You always work in these four-month frames. Like yeah. This is the, I'm asked to consider my next four months. That's how you did it so far. Yeah, and it's forward, not yeah. backwards. That's another bit of uncoupling, because you don't know how much you will work. So it helps you realize that it's not about how much you work or how much you contribute. It's about how much you need it. Obviously, you can push the point to extremes. It's like you're going to work one hour in the next four months and you ask for the $200,000 house. But you actually just release and entrust to people's common sense. I don't know, even know what word. To, it's like it's trust that people will care for resources and for themselves. Yeah. Um, it's um, mostly has been created by four people and and at the end of every distribution cycle there's also feedback on the process that gets integrated and and it, it and it is it gets updated and upgraded but this is the result of baby steps there was nothing, uh, you know, like three years ago when we really started this process. Now comes a third question, sorry. Um, no, this is great. So you do that every, uh, every four months. And how long would you say the process takes? Like for the four people, the three people that steward it, is it like a week or like is it... Oh, the actual distribution? Yeah. like The like decision the making? Of, so the decision making? People, no, the, interview, the interviews is however long it would take. Some interview can be 10 minutes and some interview can be an hour. So I'm, I'm trying to get a sense of the work that now especially the three people put in to actually make all of that happen because it feels like a, a big piece of work. Yes. And I imagine it is at least a week in total that they spend on just that process. I don't actually know, but, uh, but I think they would be very happy to talk with you. Yeah. Okay. 
But if you think, let's say, if it's 30 interviews, that's 30 hours, up to 30 hours. Uh, there is the design, there is the thinking through, you know, like for example, yesterday they had a meeting to really go through the list of all the teams to think through how to apply the criteria of who to invite and discovering that no matter how clear you are, there are some gray zones and then you need to think and put more energy. So it is work, but it is only once every four months. It's not like a monthly thing. Most places do a monthly cycle and that, that would be completely overwhelming. Yeah? I have two questions. Um, how do you deal with when people have debt? Like they can also put it as... Debt? Debt. Uh, debt. They owe money to someone, yeah. a bank or something. They would, put it, they would put it in, you know, like I have, you know, I need to give back, you know, this much money okay. that I owe. So that it would, would be, be fully part. Hmm? It would be fully part of the Yes, it doesn't mean they will receive it. Yeah. There is a there is a difference between I make a request and then I receive it. Yeah. I may or may not receive what I what I request. Yeah. And everyone who wants to engage and work within NGL needs to be willing to live by that uncertainty. But so far no one has gone hungry within those who have committed to do it. And there is, there is like a deep sacred wisdom that somehow makes it work. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, in the last several times, each time there was a one large chunk of money that came from somewhere. And initially I said, okay, that's for this time, but what are we going to do next time? And it has happened now enough times that I'm thinking, okay, somehow, there's going to be a chunk of money that will come from somewhere. I don't know where. But it has happened enough times now that there's some surrender to, we will figure it out. Yeah. Maybe has that, that happened in the context of servicing needs or just spontaneity or both? Like aversions or both? Like where this chunk of money comes? Different things at different times. Uh, for example, one time... Um, there was an amount of money that was given in 2018 for a purpose bef before all this was happening. It was given for, or not 2017, for a purpose that no longer exists. And um, so that money was waiting and waiting and waiting for the people who were involved with that other purpose to decide what to do. And eventually I just said, you know what? This isn't happening. Nobody's coming up with an idea, so I'm just going to take it to NGL, which I did. This was after like a year and a half of trying to talk with people, um, none of whom were going to get it individually. So it wasn't like, it was like who to give it to, maybe this, but none of them were like concrete ideas. So then suddenly there was $6,500 in, in one of the cycles. It's like that. This didn't, it's every which way. I don't understand it. It's the first time I even talk about it publicly because it's so weird. Mm -hmm. well, what yeah. I really sense with you in the pod is that there's a real sense of connection to your needs. And like this is not about the pod. This is NGL as a whole. Ah. NGL as a whole. I'm talking about the distribution circle of NGL. Every time in the last two years, there was some particular large chunk of money that came in a different way. Uh, got it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, that's had nothing to do with the pod. A whole different ball game. Yeah. Um, so people come in, they join this process, and how can they leave? What is your... What do you mean, how can they if leave? If people want to leave that or want to leave NGL, they would just say thank you and leave, or do you have like a whole... Hmm? Uh, the one person wanted to check if they can... They they were offered work outside NGL, so we did a whole community discernment with them. Mm -hmm. so yeah, and, and, in term, and, and the decision was that it would serve NGL better for that person to go get a particular, do a particular project and bring in money to NGL okay. and do less work within NGL for that period of time. That was one of the chunks of money that came. Interesting. Yeah. Um, 
Yes. Just how do you, do you have any process of aligning the money which is given with your values? For example, with this person that was uh, robbed from the need that, that, that this person had, like how do you align giving money to needs that might not be aligned maybe with the principles of nonviolence or? I, we have a, dif a difference uh, here. Uh, sorry, uh, maybe I didn't want to make it specific for the needs, but for example, a person uh, needs maybe 100 euros or 200 euros for food per month. But what kind of food do you get with this? Like, do you have any? At the, at the moment, I don't, I, we don't have this. Yeah. But I am imagining, I've never thought of this, and it's, it's a cool one for us to think about. But my intuition in the moment, as I'm hearing the question, is that as the shared risk grows, um, the value pressure will go, grow. So I'm comparing it to what is happening within our pod, where we are in full shared risk. And we talk a lot about what each of us buys or doesn't buy, because it, it impacts all of us. So not um, actually, the way I'm saying it sounds like we are monitoring each other. That's not what is happening. It's the questions arise as general questions. But within the pod, everybody just spends the money however they're going to. We have full trust of each other. But I see that the question of values will come with more shared risk, and I love it. I will bring it to others to talk about. Don't have an answer. I, I, but since this is filmed, I want to say that I don't, I don't, my value system doesn't link nonviolence to not eating animals at all yeah and if if, if uh, you want to hear more i have an article on medium it's called carrot oppression and the othering of unwanted species so it's all laid out there if you are interested all right yeah so along this this line i was also curious what if i'm really not agreeing with uh with something another person needs. Like me was a already good example. What really is disturbing my ethical or moral or whatsoever value system. Yeah. You will begin a process of giving feedback. You will engage with it. I don't have an answer. But it, the, the logic of the process will take you towards engaging with each other to see how to solve it. There are no rules. We, there are no rules. There, you will notice, you know, you said rules and I changed it to criteria. A rule is something you don't break. Criteria is something you use and then in the moment you see what are the actual needs, the actual resources, the actual impacts that are going on and you figure it out. We are really good at it, humans, but we don't usually function this way. Dialogue is powerful because of the process of mutual influencing. <laughs>